Our Lenten journey with Jesus arrives at the cross. We have followed Jesus from the upper room to the We have followed as Jesus stood trial before the chief priests and Pontius Pilate. And we followed him on the cross. On the cross, Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. On the cross, Jesus shed his blood for us and for our salvation. Good Friday is a day where we see our sin most clearly. We see our sin heaped upon Jesus as he suffers and dies on the cross. We confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and our neighbors in our thoughts, words, and actions. We have sinned against you and our neighbors in the things we have done and the things we have left undone. O Lord, have mercy on us. God invites us to see our forgiveness clearly in Jesus. Out of his abundant mercy and grace, God gave his son to die and rise for you. Because Jesus shed his blood, we are forgiven. Because Jesus endured the cross, we are saved. As a called and ordained servant of our crucified Lord, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you endured the extreme suffering of crucifixion, shedding your blood so that the world would be forgiven. Keep our eyes fixed upon your cross where you won forgiveness and salvation for the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our psalm for this day is Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that have been for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, for I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul. And you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, and an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. For I hear the whispering of many, terror on every side, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. 
My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol. Let the lion rescue you, which seeks in the sun of the and his righteousness. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, and worked for those who take refuge in you, in the sight of the children of mankind. Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in a besieged city. Love the Lord, all you his saints. The Lord preserves the faithful, but abundantly repays the one who acts in pride. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah, the 52nd and 53rd chapters. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground, He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the, with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him 
that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. The epistle is from Hebrews, the fourth and fifth chapters. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your son should bear for us the pains of the cross and so remove from us the power of the adversary. 
Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may remain seated for the first half of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup? that the Father has given me? We sing stanza one of hymn number 450. <laughs> So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. 
So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. We sing stanza two. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. We sing stanza three. If you are able, I invite you to please stand. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, struck him with their hands. 
Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that, I, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the corrupt officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. We sing stanza four. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the Place of a Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. We sing stanza five.
But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. We sing stanza six. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. We sing stanza seven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the 19th chapter of St. John's Gospel, the chapter prior, or right after 
or what we heard today. It says, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Blood. Blood is a major theme in John's Gospel. If you go back to John chapter 1, the 29th verse, the evangelist writes, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb, Jesus, will shed his blood. John 1 verse 36 reiterates the central idea in the fourth, in the fourth gospel. Behold the Lamb of God. And in John 6, in the 54th verse, Jesus says, Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. In John's gospel, blood serves one purpose, and that is to wash away sin. Sin, that ugly three-letter word that we hear so often. Sin, always standing at the door, always standing at the door of our lives. That's because you and I never measure up. We never do enough. We all fall short of the glory of God. But just because sin keeps knocking at the door, it does not mean that we have to let him in. And yet, we do. We let him in. And when we do, sin trashes our living room in basement. He makes a mess out of our kitchen and our bathrooms. And the backyard, well, don't get me started. And then after making a terrible, terrible mess, sin wants to stay with us for the rest of our lives. And what do we say? Sure, great idea. Great idea, sin. Come right on in. What? And so we spend the rest of our lives trying to get rid of sin and all of its ugly consequences. And you and I have done this regularly. We see it in others' lives as well. We wonder why the world is going to pot. But here are some ways we do that. Here are some examples of how we try to get rid of sin. The first way, or one way we do that, is by projection. Projection, it's one way we try to kick sin out of the house. We play the blame game. Project one sin onto someone else. Blame someone, blame anyone. Blame your husband, blame your wife, blame your parents, blame your teachers, and while you're at it, blame the government and blame the system. It's not my fault. Another way we try to conquer sin is through rationalization. What I did is no big deal. It didn't really hurt anybody. It's just this once. Besides, no one will ever know. When projection and rationalization don't work, the third thing we try is comparison. If you think I'm bad, well, you should see my boss. At least I'm not as bad as my sister. Well, remember what he did? Ha, huh, I'm a saint compared to that sinner. How many of us have not compared ourselves to others where we think we're so much better? And then another way to get rid of sin is repression. Repression is to stuff it down, stuff it way, way down. In other words, live in denial. I know I was wrong, but I'm just not going to think about it. A fifth way to say adios to sin is through distraction. And this one, too, we see it all over. Rush, rush around from one event to the next so that at night you collapse, that you're so worn out, you're run so ragged that when you hit the pillow, sin doesn't haunt your heart and muddle your mind. You don't have to pray then to God asking you to forgive your sins that day. And then lastly, there is evasion. Pop a pill, have a drink, 
maybe even smoke a joint, get addicted to TV, sports, money, or some other thing, whatever it is. Anything to evade the all-consuming consequences of sin. My friends, do you see the problem in all of this? It doesn't work. It never has, and it never will. We wake up the next day, and guess what? Sin is still there, trashing our house, making life miserable, sometimes absolutely unbearable. There's only one solution to sin. Stand under, stand under Christ's cross with John. Listen to what John says. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. You see, John was there. He was there at the cross. He saw it all happen. John gives this testimony, and his testimony is true. And what would that be? Simply put, Christ's blood alone washes away sin. All sin. Everyone's sin. Yours, mine, his, hers, theirs, for everyone who believes, all sin is forgiven. Yes, sin is forgiven, and that's free for us, isn't it? The free gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yet, my friends, on this Good Friday, we are called to remember what it cost Jesus. His crucifixion at Golgotha was an act of utter brutality and barbarism. Jesus is first stripped before Herod's soldiers. He's stripped again at the command of Pilate. And then he is stripped once more at the cross when the soldiers divide his garments by casting lots. And there Jesus hangs in shame, bare naked, before all to see. When Jesus was flogged by the Romans the next day before he was uh, crucified, lacerations tore into his underlying skeletal muscles and produced quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Roman soldiers used a whip of braided leather thong, thongs with spikes woven into them. So when the whip would strike the flesh, the spikes would cause deep bruises and lacerations. We can't imagine what this had to have been like. The whippings would have gone all the way from the shoulders down the back and the back of the legs. The Romans threw Jesus on the wood and drove tapered spikes through his wrists and feet, all the while mocking him and spitting on him. On the cross, Christ's arms were stretched six inches upward so his shoulders were dislocated. The stress of his diaphragm forced his chest into an inhaling position. And so in order to exhale, Christ had to push up, using his feet to relieve pressure on the diaphragm and temporarily exhale. In doing so, the nail would tear through his feet, eventually locking up against his tarsal bones. For six hours, this breathing motion went on and on and on, with Christ scraping his shredded back against the coarse wood until he became completely exhausted and unable to push up and breathe. As Jesus slowed down his breathing, he went into respiratory acidosis, leading to an irregular heartbeat. In fact, with his heart beating erratically, Jesus would have known that death was near. Jesus died of cardiac arrest. John 19. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. On this Friday that we call good, John invites you and me to come under the cross to see Jesus. To see Jesus in his suffering and shame for you and for me, to see his death for us, that we might never have to experience that kind of death, and most importantly, eternal death. 
He calls us to see and believe this love of God for us poor sinners, a love that cannot be outdone by anything or anyone. To see his blood, his innocent, perfect, holy blood shed upon us. To see Jesus glorified as he hangs on the cross, paying the ultimate price for our sin. We don't need to, to, nor can we get rid of the sin in our lives, ourselves. The only solution is to take it to Jesus, to take it to his cross, for there we see his bloodshed that cleanses us from every sin. Listen to what John says and believe. May it be that you and I are never ashamed of Jesus and the cross upon which he dies. For it is our salvation. And may it be that we lift high the cross for others to see and proclaim the love of Christ so that others may know and believe that Jesus has died for them as well. May our God grant it for the sake of our suffering and dying Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God's peace, which surpasses all human understanding, guard our hearts and minds through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing the series hymn, Behold the Lamb of God, John said.
One addition that we're going to have at the end of the service or after the prayers, after the what is called the strepitus, which is the slamming of the book that indicates Christ's tomb is closed, the chimes will chime for 33 times to indicate Christ's age when he died on the cross. Please stand. Lord Jesus Christ, defend your church throughout the world from the assaults of Satan so that we be kept firm in the one true faith. What language shall we borrow? To thank Lord Jesus Christ, bless all people who serve you in their callings and vocations. Grant them a measure of your humility and servanthood. What language shall we borrow? To thank Lord Jesus Christ, you are the great teacher of your people. Bless all those who receive instruction in the faith, that they might be faithful unto death and receive the crown of life. What language shall we borrow? To thank thee, dearest friend. Lord Jesus Christ, you possess all authority. Guide those who have been given earthly authority, especially our president, Congress, governor, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. What language shall we borrow? To thank Lord Jesus Christ, you are the light that shines in the darkness. Shine your light upon all those who walk in darkness apart from you, so that they might see your love for them. What language shall we borrow? Thank you, dear Lord Jesus Christ, you endured suffering and shame from your enemies. Strengthen us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. What language shall we borrow? To thank you, dearest Lord Jesus Christ, you are the true vine. We are the branches. Feed us with your word and sacraments that we might bear fruit in keeping with repentance so that the world might praise you. What language shall we borrow? To thank you, dearest friend. Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing be upon your people who have held the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance, that we may receive your pardon and the gift of your comfort, and may increase in faith and take hold of eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Thank mm-hmm. you.